<laughs> so just to give you a, a hint of context, um, this is Human Sea Reads for his campus in 1947. Uh, one of the oldest photos we were able to in the big red oval is surrounding the building that is our project. Uh, you'll see more up close, but in this little photo, only two of five arms on this building have been constructed. So this is, we, we've gone in closer. Uh, the rectilinear building in the forefront is one of the oldest dorms on the campus, built Spencer Residence Hall, built in 1904. And the five pinwheel shaped things with this little dome in the middle is the only dining facility on the campus. So some of the um, constraints that faced us in this project were one is a public university. We do answer our jur jurisdiction um, controlling all codes and everything is the North Carolina State Construction Office. Uh, there were clearly, as in most pu public projects, budget constraints that had to be attended with. I mentioned it's the only dining hall on campus. Um, they had to maintain continuous operation, three meals a day, 1,200 plus students per meal while our complete renovation happened. No breaks, no shutdowns. And that, of course, required phased construction. And just as a point of interest before leaving the slide, you see the little white, flat looking thing that connects the residence hall to the dome. That wing built in 1904 was the original dining hall attached to the building. So one other constraint uh, that we had, so this is rotated around now. This is not north, south, east, and west. It's perpendicular. But to point out that the primary access across campus is um, shown here left to right, which is really north and south. That is the College Avenue. So that's in this old photograph you can see it very clearly. Another constraint to the project is they wanted a secondary perpendicular access, which would be east-west, to cross the campus and it got runs straight through the dock. So just to break it down, our pinwheel shape, you can see the multiple wings and the years in which those wings were constructed. So we had the 1904 um, Spencer wing at the 12 o'clock position. And they didn't do what you might think, go like around in the sequence. No, it jumps to, <coughs> let's see, I think it jumps across to the there's a 22, a 20. Yes, right. There's a 27, 25. At the 2 o'clock. There's a 27, which is at the 11, 10 o'clock. And there's 39 at 7 o'clock. And then all the infill, the little wedges, happened sometime between then and 1986. So that's what we inherited. The red um, outlines on this diagram indicate generally what our structural load bearing walls are built. And so this is a lower level. The grade changes in the midst of this building one entire grade level. And all entrances lead to. So you can see we have one, two, three entrances to the building that a student would take to enter. And you can see where it's going. So if you're on College Avenue, you walk down a set of steps. You enter the lower left, what's almost like a subway tunnel. And it curves. 
and then you come out at this sort of multi duck down, walk up and down some stairs, and eventually you'll make your way towards the how to access the dining. There's a north entrance. This is pretty much the back door next to the mechanical room. And this is the bird cage. Uh, a structure built in 86 when they modernized. So here we are on the second, what would be the second level of the building. So that's the main entrance. And so those are student choices to get in. And then they all make their way to the center of the building. See the blue handrail. You might be on the lower level. Right. And this is as we approach meal time. And then the dining hall is on the second level. You can see the lines of mail wrap and they go right on out the building. And here we are at the top. And where do we go? You just get to the top. You can't see anything because there's fire rated doors. And you just, Trent, where shall I meet you? Let's pick a door. So there's little signs that would tell to you, well, this is the Spartan Cafe. You have no idea when you get to the top where any food choices are or what the space was. So that's just a picture of the upper existing dining level. So you have a, a sense of what you just saw in the pictures. Right there in the middle. Right in the middle. Where you came up. That's the stair right in the center. So you've made your way from the three points and you all go to the center on the lower level and then you can get upstairs. So that's how you get to go. And um, so the first thing we did is one of the goals of the project was we have to completely modernize the dining experience. Students today have grown up with much more variety and many other rich experiences and this is a big university issue now. What are the amenities that students are expecting and how does that attract new students and what do mom and dad care about and what are they paying for? So the first thing we needed was a very different approach to dining, which is dispersed venues, many choices that could be flexible and change over time. And so this was a schematic layout of, of 11 different venues. But you'll notice that the first thing that requires is to blow out the middle of the building and disperse the menu, uh, the venues. And of course, all those walls we had to blow out are, are low there. They're the ends of the barn. We call them the barns. So each of those had a whole bearing end wall that had to be substantially removed or compromised. The little images was just a rendering of some early studies we did. That's not a photograph of a real. That those were 3D renderings we did to start visualizing. We wanted to open up access, so that would be coming through the front and up the stair. And ultimately, a section then on the left of the screen is where you would enter at one grade level. Um, College Avenue, and now there's a monumental stair that goes right to the dining level, not to the middle of the building and up the spiral. And then the whole, you're through the whole thing. And on the fountain side, which is not in the picture, you're on the second level. So you have straightforward access in the new concept to dining. This begins to hint that some of the changes you'll see a bit more of as we walk through the structural um, changes and how they're done how wood fits into the picture. And then just a taste of having to keep all of this operating meant that we had to go through four or five phases of construction. And you can see phase one just started in one wing, and then two took two wings and an interstitial space that became a new dish run. Three was the big play, a really difficult thing to see because that's where our wood feature comes in. And then four, um, four was a temporary kitchen that they did not do, so phase four really went around the pinwheel. Now this happened on upper lower floors concurrently, 
most of the time, but sometimes even that became decoupled. And then we'd have to do many sub-phases just to get access and, and continue to re restage the, uh, the dining. And I'm going to let the trip talk a little bit about not really get into the meat of this. So, you can see the brick ends of the barns, if you know. There's, these are gambling roof structures. Um, the spring line of those is to the bottom of the big steel truss. And everything that's gray, in fact, those are actually sleepers. Everything gray above it is a, is a big steel truss, probably 20 feet deep. The attics were filled with all kinds of old mechanical systems and abandoned this and that, and mattresses, and out <laughs> Everything in the world was up there. So the, the task was that center dome room, and then all the way out to the ends of those barns, that was the area of the plan that we wanted to open up and clear space, pull all the rabbit barn walls out down the bottom of the second floor. So, we're trying to figure out well, what's the these are kind of strange buildings. What's the best way to integrate all of these? We started looking around and crawling around in the building. So <coughs> we crawled up into some of these attics and found these big trusses. And, and one of the things we noticed, we look at this bottom picture, it doesn't really show the truss, but the bottom cord, instead of being a straight thing all the way across right the spring line, it's, it's kind of Segments that arched up and curved back down to the, to the measurement bearing wall on each side. That's interesting. I wonder what that's all about. And um, we crawled around a little bit more and started excavating into the first ceiling. We realized that the ceiling was hung right under the bottom floor of these trusses. It was, was kind of arched and curved. And then there was another ceiling hung below that that was 19. 30s or something. And then there was another ceiling hung from that ceiling. So the bottom of the truss was maybe 20 feet above the floor, but the final in place ceiling at this time had, had uh, kind of tumorously grown down to about 12 feet off the floor. <laughs> but we did notice that, that first ceiling was this kind of arch form curve. So oh, that's interesting. And then that flat wing that Cheryl mentioned that was the original part of the building. The original, original dining hall. We pretty much decided the only part of that that's original are the outside bearing walls. We think that the lower level was originally just a crawl space, kind of like under your house, and uh, it had since been excavated out from underneath and had a, had a floor built. Yeah. And the glue lamp timbers up above, this, the top picture shows not exactly correctly, we'll see pictures of it later, but they're curved tapered glue lamp arches. So the bottom is actually curved, the top is straight. And it's a really common blue land form. But those didn't exist in 1904, so I'm pretty sure that didn't. So we don't know if the two interventions were done at the same time, but we we're finding another arch, basically. Like in that. So we started thinking about, well, how do we see the ends of these barns? You know, they're historic. Sort of, you know, Part of the reason we didn't blow this building down and build a new building, which probably would have been cheaper, <laughs> and not, not been nearly as interesting. Part of the reason was they, they wanted to preserve some of their history. You know, the history of the so we, we didn't want to hide that history, so we wanted to expose it. So, so how can we how can we do that? Well, a lot of tooth and gnashing and everything, but we decided we'd put these arch, circular arches above the existing cables and kind of extend the cable line and extend it in arch form instead of the cable form. So there you can see that's the circle up above the weirdness out here on the sides. So this is kind of how it ended up. Now the reality is those those circular forms are all absolutely identical, same, same rigging, same everything. If you extend those together, you will get Back down the center of those open skylights, you'll get a, a groin, maybe even long. 
and um, and those five ruins kind of generate all the structure coming out. The problem is, go back to go. Yeah, so those are those five ruin lines, and if you look at them, this is on the lower level, and these are the very walls of the lower level that didn't want to mess with it. You'll notice that those five lines are right on five primary axes that are kind of built into the building, a little harder to change. So we said, hmm, how do we deal with that? Now, we'll just split that drawing sideways and we'll put a pair of columns. So that, that's really what we did. So either side of the red line was we, we split one drawing line into two and said that's, that's a good place for a skylight. So we had the columns on either side of the corridor like this and you can see the main march that are split. So here's kind of a you know, rather little blow up model of how all that looks. And we're still just talking about form here, how, how the geometry was generated. Um, you can see the variety of some of those trusses and the different barns. It's interesting, those barns, they're steel, riveted trusses. Um, the earliest ones actually got some cast iron in it. And they have, um, some of them, three of them have wood heavy timber decking laid over top as, as, the, as the decking material under all that zinc roof and, uh, and slate that we saw in the first pictures. And one that later in 1936 is large waste and a concrete deck uh, over lath. So you look up and there's some squished out concrete coming through lath. And all of them had that same similar form on the outside. Show you. Yeah, this was our transition here. Oh, so, you have to stand So at this point, you can see we had some constraints to solve, and we had really had come to a way to reconfigure the interior, and it's, it's all about geometry right now. So, we knew we had to take that whole sun off. We knew we had to put a new top on it. I called Trip in frustration and said, come over here, we gotta figure out how to put a top on this thing that looks like something. Um, and he said, well, let's talk about wood. Um, because we could have done this out of steel. But, so we got very intrigued with the whole idea of wood and what wood could do because this expanse that we're talking about is about a 105 foot diameter and it's connecting from a pentagonal shape at the bottom coming to a, to make a groin to kind of vaulted dumb. And we started talking about wood and we love the idea of wood from several points of view. It's a warm material. We thought it would be unique. It was large scale enough to be more than just a cursory um, nod to wood, like a wood cabinet or a wood door. But the first question came up is, well, what about the economics of this kind of structure built out of wood versus the more traditional method? And I think Tripp intuitively sort of felt, I think it'll be competitive. We didn't have any hard numbers, that's just intuition. The structural engineer says, I think it'll be competitive. Well, we were falling in love with this. And we showed this idea to the owner who also falls in love with the possibilities of wood. One of our owners is both architect and structural engineer, and back in early in his life, done many wood structures of his own. So he was totally in love with it. The hardest part that we had was the perception of the cost. Tight budget, and they didn't want to fall further in love with this without knowing. Because the first thing, every single person said, yeah, but that's going to cost more and we have to do it. So we had a seam at risk, and we stopped and did an exercise. We actually took the developed drawings, 
how many people did we send it out? They sent it out to three or four major um, companies that do this wood construction, and they got actual pricing back for the packages we done. And then we went to a meeting with a major steel fabricator, steel fab. And as we're talking through it, they revealed the numbers that we got from the wood companies. And I don't remember the numbers, but they were not far apart. I mean, it was three or four, several close together. And the folks from Steel Fab said, well, if we just put a box on top of it, like Walmart, it'll cost us double of any of the wood prices that these folks have given us. So we're not talking about competitive, we are talking about half the cost. But it took the seam at risk actually showing the numbers to the owner for us to get past and proceed. They all loved the idea and they had a very hard time accepting that this was better than competitive. So that was that's one of the biggest obstacles we had to overcome. How about code environment trip? I just find notes here because when we need to be all that kind of stuff. So, as Cheryl mentioned, uh, the authority having jurisdiction for this state owned project is the North Carolina State Construction Office. They're within wood and everything, they don't have any prescriptive thou shalt not or any of that. They just say, they, they do have a few things, they're mostly electrical. I don't have to worry about it. But within the structure, it's just compliant with code. At the time, the, the code was the North Carolina 2009 code, which is based on 2006 IBC. So this building, what we, what we used was um, type 1B construction. Uh, the roof for that in, in the table 600 is a, a mile mile roof. And there's two things you have to look at in that. Everybody should use this table before. But look at, there's two footnotes. One of them is footnote D. It says, for all occupancies, heavy timber roof construction can be used where the required rate is one hour or less. Okay? So this kind of fits that exactly, except as you will probably see, we actually have some steel in our our roof. So it's sort of a hybrid. It's not all heavy timber. It doesn't meet every definition of heavy timber. Every member within the timber portions and all the decades meet the definitions of heavy timber, but we have these steel components. So there's another footnote that says, except for a few occupancies, and there's some high hazard occupancies and things, um, fire protection is not required in roof structures where all the members are 20 feet or more above the, the floor immediately below them. Um, one important thing to remember there is that doesn't change the requirements for that building type. So if you're in a non-combustible building type, you're stuck in a non-combustible. There's a little blurb that says, if you're a non-combustible building type, it basically says, if you're a non-combustible building type and you're trying to meet this requirement, you can use fire retardant treatment to do it. There's also a whole heavy timber thing that you're allowed to use. We kind of combined the two of those things on this project. Um, the over 20 feet allows our steel members to be unprotected, and the heavy timber that's allowed anyway for this type of line out there. So, um, that's much of the so, so, there's a few, um, and that all looks good. We got it approved from state construction conceptually, and then we started saying, well, Nobody quantified these in the cost estimate, but there's a lot of other things we get. We get this warm aesthetic from wood. You know, you're not going to get that from steel and drywall. When we finish erecting the structure, in this sense, this is still under construction. That's the finished product. I mean, there's no command later and paint, paint ceilings and wrap stuff and chip wood and all that. But, that's what you see. It, it was actually pre-finished material in this case, but just a clear seamer on it. So there was really no painting or anything to be done. 
Um, we don't have any hard numbers on this, and some of it's probably due to the shape and the volume, but we've done a lot of wood heavy timber structures, and you know, we might do a similar gymnasium or something, and also do it out of our choice of steel. Wood buildings are always acoustically better performing. They're just something about it. I'm sure there's great research that we can do. But. So the acoustics, you just get this nice benefit. If you did this similar steel building, you would be hanging acoustical banners and absorption things all, all through it because it's going to echo. Um, for this particular project, it has some general extensibility, but for this particular project, show you a little later, the site is really, really restricted. There's a honking big existing building sitting here, and there's not too many places where you can set up a crane to get to it. So the light weight of the individual wood members made the viability of this construction you know, actually superior to, say, a much larger steel desk. And the lightweight also, because part of this whole thing was we had to support this new shape on top of the building. So we had to drill down through the building and put in 10 new foundations. Those 10 columns that we stuck down through the building had to land somewhere. So having a lot of weight, lower foundation was, that, that was a positive benefit as well. About sustainability. Now, of course, this, um, they had a desire for this building to be a LEED certified building, hopefully at a silver level. And the first thing everybody said is, well, I might have been kind of FSC certified wood. And of course, as you know, the whole FSC certification, Southern Yellow Pine, that whole um, thing doesn't necessarily equate in our region to the best sustainable response in using wood. So, Tripp did some calculations. If we did that type of wood, where would we have to get it? How much would we have to pay for it? And it's not just the cost that you would have paid, but it's where you shipped it from, and you're sitting in the middle of wood country. And so we said, no, we're not going to have an FSC certified wood, but the material was um, sustainably um, harvested under the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. And the farm timber is um, used and manufactured solid decking, the two by six dimensional lumber, um, tongue and groove, edge preparation, and in the blue lands, which are like, you know, from the. Uh, and then, so even though that the largest blue lands are 33 inches deep and 10 and a half inches wide, no old growth trees were needed to make the large members. So all the material was sourced from and fabricated in Alabama, which was not too far from the job site. We felt that that was a more sustainable and responsible approach to using wood in the building. And so that was our thing. And of course, there's the issue about the carbon sequestration and, and other issues that are not necessarily accounted for in the lead certification uh, process. So, Tripp's going to walk us through building this thing. Now, students are eating lunch around <laughs> three times a day. And they don't even know this is happening. Well, they know about the vibration of me. I'm the daughter of Jackhammer. <laughs> but, yeah, they build all these temporary walls, and part of the reason that phasing kind of wrapped around the building and the reason we had to build the first new addition in, in the initial phase was so we get some vertical circulation in the elevator and then you know, each phase kind of glommed onto that so the students could circulate in that area if I would build walls to isolate them from the active construction zone. So some of the details here, um, as we had talked about, the, the roof deck on the building is, is an inch and a half thick, it's a time roof deck, it's basically two by six the uh, circular vaults, the circular arches, regardless of the span, you know, they start out the longest span near the barn and get smaller as they get toward the middle. 
but every one of them is exactly the same size and the same radius, they're just you know, a shorter segment. That had some fabrication uh, cost benefits. So they're all six and three quarter wide by 16 and a half inch deep blue lens. Corn archers are a little bit crazy. They're, they're actually an ellipsoid shape if you think about the intersection, but they are, um, as Cheryl mentioned, 10 and a half by 33 inches deep. And they have this really interesting little, we call it the curved wedge, but there's a, a sort of a meaning piece that can be spliced on the top of them. So they're, they're pretty much a straight, you know, rectangular extruded form, and then there's this extra piece that was added to the top. It's non structural in that sense, but it allowed for some of the some of the roof construction transitions. Um, the steel hardware is, is, is custom fabricated by a steel fabricator. Um, very often, uh, Lulin manufacturers make their own hardware, but in this case, there's so much interaction with structural steel with that uh, it just worked better than this. Actually, in this particular case, because of the bonding walls in, in North Carolina for, for contractors, I couldn't really locate a blue land contractor fabricator that met those. And so they actually were brought in under the steel contractor. So they were sub the steel contractor. So the coordination worked really well on passing those details back and forth and shot. Um, the other components are high strength steel tension rods that tie the thing together, and a, a steel center hub or basket, we call it. Um, we'll show you that picture in a minute. And then cast in place concrete for the columns and the, and the micro column foundations that were dug around down in the basement. So, a lot of people think that uh, Blue Land is some kind of magical food, you know, it's only done by uh, specialized fabricators. And, and there are really great fabricators out there that do their own design and fabrication. But you don't always have to specify it that way. I mean, you can design it yourself with the right expertise and everything. And it's probably specified as pretty much a commodity product. And there's nothing, nothing too magical about it. You just got to know what materials you're building with and what the capabilities of, of the available fabricators are. And there's lots of capability in fabricators in, in, in our geographic area with the project and the, the, the project site. So, yeah, that first picture was down where the students used to enter. And you were looking up, and he was looking up at, I don't think at the same time, but at this, this is where the old old, uh, old roof got pulled off, and there, there it is right before it was getting pulled off. The old roof was here. Bell roof with steel trusses bearing on these ring of uh, con uh, masonry bearing walls. And those masonry bearing walls are actually in a ring at the second level. They're, they're not entirely. They're, they're all going away. All the walls with the, uh, uh, the glue still on them from former artwork. And uh, there's the roof set up, the old roof form offset on the ground. And there's a little nice, uh, they recently re roofed this building not too much before our renovation with the zinc roof and we decided to preserve the nice zinc cupola and Cheryl's going to take it home or something. Actually, it ended up memorialized inside the building. It's got a nice little place where it sits. <laughs> the size of it. So here's, after you, the, that center ring of walls, that's in, our, that's in the zone where we want our future dining to be. So it, it's still there, but you see we left all the roof around it and that roof stayed there until after this new roof was constructed over it. And that had a lot to do with the phasing of the building. It allowed, part of the design allowed us to basically drill down through for 10 columns, construct this roof over it, and then demolish the old structure out from underneath it. That way we could keep this thing waterproof while it was still occupied while, things, while the construction was So right after they all come to stay here. Yeah. So yeah, the, the cupola there is sitting on the floor that we since infill. We infilled this entire floor here to fill that old hole up. That's now what is that the uh, the big station where they make you know, custom made the Mongolian grill, you know, 
go up there and can be played with all three of the eight of the So here's, which I, I mentioned the basket before. This is that, that steel thing, kind of looks like a, a basketball hoop, set in the middle. That's actually standing on shoring, temporary shoring, sitting on that floor that we just, that we just looked at. And those things going to it are, are walkways, catwalks, really. They're, uh, they're an owner request on the building. They're there to allow access to the center and to all the lighting so that you know, this, thing, this roof is 40 feet high, so we need some way. And we're driving a genie around inside of there and getting up to the top to replace lights. So that lets them do that. That lets them also get to the fans that are on the roof because all these kitchens have exhaust fans and kitchen exhaust. So they all, every one of those that's in the center comes out of the middle of that pentagon at the very top. The pentagon motif, you know, once you start, you kind of can't stop. So the pentagon motif got used over and over again. Even some places we used it, it is absolutely necessary in this location, but in other locations we actually used it as, we gotta cut this steel plate in some shape, we might as well cut it. Kind of shape to match the rest of the buildings. Architecture slipping into the engineering. <laughs> we wanted to know what the finishes were going to be like, what, what, how the details were going to come together. It, this whole thing had been modeled in BAM and mass ass, but there were still some, some components like the finish of the concrete columns, a lot of the roofing details for the the roof and the gutter and the skylight all come together. So we did this full scale mock up. It's down on the ground where everybody can come up and see it. The owner in particular can see it, see what they're going to be getting a few months later. But by this time, it would have been too late to change the structure. It's just how you finish it, how you detail it. And there's Cheryl testing out the pile of parts that were used for the mock up, which they're really big, right? <laughs> And this after the basket has been constructed. So the top of that basket is where all the groin arches come to. The bottom of it was where those catwalks come to the middle, and there's going to be a ladder up through the, up through it. And we're standing on the roof that stayed in place while the construction was going on. The owners and architects and everybody are all still happy. We're actually all still happy now. This is the shoring towers underneath. And you can see the, the rods coming down to the bottom right around five o'clock or something. There's a pair of rods for every set of arches. They, they come together in the middle and they spread out to the ends of the two groin arches that are separated. This is the, some of the shoring tower is still there at the bottom, but this is uh, once we got the whole thing flying which basically we tightened up all the tension rods, lift a little bit of the pressure off of it, and then the shoring towers were all on shim blocks, basically, so I could just jack them up a little bit, pull out a shim, do that all the way around, lower it down. The whole thing was monitored, we were watching it, and of course, the calculations, it, it, it deflected exactly what we expected it to, and then we started, at that point, you know, we didn't have a lot of load on it, it's just a, it's just a structural frame, and we started to put the roof and everything on it, so we didn't have to lift the way to the roof. And here's just, just some sequences. So, uh, these, these beams all typically come wrapped. You know, if they're pre-finished, they'll come wrapped. You have to worry about keeping them dry during construction so they don't get rain, water streaks, and things on them. So there's, there's a lot of recommendations and ready to go ahead and they'll tell you. You, know, you just slip the bottom of them once you get them up. That's why they're all flying around and they're still there to protect them. Beam above, slid on the bottom so the water could come out. They didn't rain on it. We just thought it was kind of interesting the way the guys put on the deck. It's, it's pretty low tech, you know, mm -hmm. just, just carpenters. So it's just heavy timber, heavy timber decking. In that picture, you can see kind of the the white, the one that's still wrapped, is actually going to be the curve of the skylights. The, the skylights are cow wall, whatever we're talking about. And this is 
before any of the decadence time, just it looks kind of like a, a rendering or something, but that's actually the, the members all set. This whole thing took, they set the whole thing in about a week. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was right at a week. The phasing. This this center phase actually was on. It was one one of the ones that actually hit the schedules. That, that's because it didn't have any substantial food service, and freezers, and all that part of it. But uh, you know, it was just just good old construction. And there were some restrooms on the lower level of this phase, um, but, but they were not in this phase on the upper level. And this one because. You know, it's unusual. They see everybody's looking at it. It was it was planned to death. I mean, you know, that those concrete beams they, they were measured about two hundred times before the first thing flew up there. Everybody wanted to know everything was going to fit. And in fact, everything fit except for the last arch on the farthest side. The arch was a little bit wider than the gap that we needed to put it. In. All I did is just put a come along on it, squeeze it. But I think the arch had relaxed a little bit since it had been fabricated. Yeah, it lost a little bit of its, its bend, basically. This is, so, so that scheme that we talked about originally of the, of the five cylindrical vaults, this one side had this flat, very five inch and four with a curve taper in it. So, well, we're going to use exactly the same scheme because we, we like the scheme and we don't want to change anything for this side. And it's just kind of an inverse thing. You know, for all the other ones, we're on the inside looking at the ends of the wall. For this one, the roof drops and that end wall becomes a wall we can look out. It's really kind of cool when it's all done. It's, it's just some windows there. It's a great source of, of light coming in from the side of the original uh, residence hall. You can actually stand in some venues and look up at the towers of the original residence hall. So it's kind of... So, as I mentioned, it's, it was all modeled in them. You can see it's actually modeled down to the little screws and whatnot. And here's the real world version of that. The beams, the, uh, the main glue lamp, there's 10 and a half, 33s, and which are actually a little oversized. Structurally, they don't need to be that big to carry the load. But we wanted some connection detail, and it didn't involve a lot of steel. So there's actually big pockets mortised into the side of them that the arches come and rest in. And that's what this is the arch, that pocket sticks three or four inches in the beam. That's some complicated detail. You have to be careful about that because you got to make sure that the bottom of that pocket and everything is well up at the top part of the beam. You don't want it on the bottom where it can pull the lamination off. That, that's a potential failure mode for a glue lamp. So that had a lot to do with the depth that we picked for the glue lamps. And this geometry, if you think about it, it's constantly changing as it rolls down. Is, it, is that arc? So the circular arch is the one off, up and off to the right. And then, so and then, bolt and, and also that right. bolt is really Not there. Bond. That yeah. So so um, so this is. Yeah. So this one here is the uh, carrying arch, the big groin arch, and this is the circular arch resting in that. This one has a pocket cut into it, and the other one's resting in there. And that bolt is really just a retainer bolt. Keep things from lifting out. Were all those head cuts done at the fabrication plant, or were they done on site? Everyone was done in the fabrication plant. I was going to say, that'd be tough to do in the field. They're complex geometries, but yeah. everyone was done in the fabrication plant. I thought it might be done, when we conceived the project, we thought it might be done. Some of the plants have seen C machining. These guys, uh, Structural Lamb in Alabama, yeah. they do most of their work by hand. So there's a guy with, uh, with wood chisels and, and saws, and it, it, they did beautiful work. Yeah. But they modeled every bit of that in 3D BIM stuff, and it actually, you know, it's kind of a nice cross check. It checked exactly with what we with what we had modeled. Another connection, one, one that's real important is these arches, you know, when you load an arch, it wants to spread out. That's what those tie rods are for. We wanted 
you know, we have this, as it relates to those kind of things, we have this don't mess around with 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 bolts through the beam or anything. We're going to go capture the end of the beam. So this steel thing spans across, the steel tube spans across the ends of a pair of groin arches. And there's a pair of tie rods go back. So you would have to push that steel thing off the end of the building to, you know, that's what the tie rods hold it. So we're not relying on a bolt going through the beam or anything to resist. We're actually capturing the end of the beam and holding the steel. And you can see how close it is to the existing roof that we're building over top of. It's kind of interesting. We had to look at all of them, do a 3D laser scanning. They just scanned all that so we can make sure we're going to clear all of them because all of them look the same. But in reality, um, you know, like here, that's probably the closest point that one comes to the roof. The identical, the identical condition on another wing, it might be three feet higher. But the concept allowed me to adjust those while having this absolutely repetitive form in the middle. And that's what it ended up looking like with the, the skylights over top and the, uh, and the finished roof. Until the roof gets up. It's a standing seam roof. We actually, uh, the, the decking, wood deck, it's covered with a couple layers. So actually, layers were split so they formed the curve of rigid insulation and, and joint staggered. And then it also have several layers of plywood. Also, thinner layers to one and three quarter ply. Two kind of blocks, and they are staggers, but also you get a nice smooth form. So these are just images of real construction here you go the tower this is where it's all coming together up at the top and those metal things are the steel end hoods going out so the metal pipes are yeah. the vents and the, the gray tubes which later got painted uh, some, some noble shade of bronze but those are uh, um, those vents From above the catwalks, which were really for access for the owner, but there was one going into the end of each gable, and there you can kind of see the little city developing below. Then looking back up, you can see four of the five skylights. That shows the both the, the typical end of the wind, uh, brick barns. But you can see where the skylight, uh, the um, catwalk, is also used not just for access to walk on it, but we also organize the main mechanical runs by hanging them uh, just directly from the bottom of the catwalks. You can, you'll see that in every photograph. And these later ones were done as the venues were completed, the finishes were in place, and students are beginning to circulate to each of these themed restaurant areas and the seating of course expands into the wings. And so you think about, as I said, you know, it's all about first impressions when you come. So we have torn out the old bird cage that you saw in the front. So now you start to look at the new first impressions. They seem the front uh, fountain balconies with outdoor dining. Um, some of the communicating stairs and other parts of the building have tables all around them. Another view looking up and you see the catwalk crossing and the, the vaulted ceiling above. Um, the incidental gathering spaces were not just for dining but there's also lounge seating interspersed. Just have to throw one more in with the venues and the dining in the middle. That one does show the church paper through ends from the old the bar over there. So we had a little touch up to do that out there. And just for fun, on the left, 
was one of the old existing barn structures where we had to remove all the multiple layers of home ceilings, and that was required by the State Construction Office to help us meet the code. So in addition to the new wood structure, we uncovered existing wood structure and refinished and repainted and repaired everything that was there. And so this was part of their last branding um, of this. So this is signage we developed to help them start to look at. Um, so, you know, it has a strong identity. Of course, we had to do an art piece about the cupola because they were all about the cupola. But central to the branding was not just the new things there, but their pride and their historic components on campus. So you can kind of see the, the rest of the transformation. But I think this would never have been the building it became had we not had the opportunity to build a significant geometric structure in the middle that allowed us to open up and then choose wood to, um, to really complete that. Is that okay? And any questions that you have, I'm happy to turn that. Questions? Did, did it turn out on budget as you hoped? Did everything turn out on budget as you projected? Everything about the schedule, I mean the the budget for the parts we controlled did. There was a separate food service contractor that the owner had engaged, and they were not under ours or the CMA risk control. And I would say they somewhat went off the rails in the very final phase of the project, which held up the day a phase four but not the center part but the parts in terms of the rest of the building um, yeah we stayed on the budget we had arrived at I was gonna say I, I don't know much about this university but I know it's UNC Greensboro now but was it something else before yeah it actually was um, North Carolina Women's College Originally set up as a teacher's college. Okay. My mother was there. Oh, and then, good, a few years. Okay. In the North Carolina system, that's one of the 16 or 17 state universities now, and it's one of the fastest growing campuses. And it's right in the triad area. So it's a great spot where you have you know, Winston Salem and High Point. And so it's a very fast growing campus. Did the 39 month construction period include the CM grid? At what level did you The CM was responsible for pre construction services during the design phase. So they were selected on a qualifications based selection process, as the, our team was. Um, during design, they looked at constructability <coughs> issues. Um, and cost. No, we no, we were still programming in advanced planning. They came on board, so they looked at costs and they looked at um, constructability. Now we had we maintained an independent cost estimator of our own, and so at every phase we did our estimating, and they did their estimated estimating, and then we had cost reconciliation. Uh, meetings to resolve where discrepancies were, who was right, why did this one or that one make certain assumptions, and that would drive any, if, if it appeared we were going over budget, then we could do some value engineering during design, not after the fact. And then, you know, part of my role was to say, but here are the eight goals you set for the project, so we'll only make a value engineering choice if we have to, then we still need to maintain the primary goals that you set for the project, otherwise the project's not a success. So that helped to form, um, form the decision making. Yeah, they, they, probably, it, it looks complicated structure and everything, but the complication of this project was the schedule and everything. That, even the building up, was pretty easy. And yeah. they, were, they were instrumental. And I don't know if you project Yes. 
Um, and so they were involved completely through the construction phase and managing all the trades. Uh, it was a joint venture, so it was Rogers Builders out of Charlotte, who is in a joint venture with them, Hardin Construction from Atlanta. And they also had a local small contractor base, so it was Rogers Hardin Davis. It was a double joint venture. And since then, Hardin has now become part of DPR Construction. Uh, How long was the design process? We started designing this in probably 2007, 8, 2008. Really? Feels longer. 2009. So design was probably a solid two years because North Carolina requires a very extended advanced planning and programming phase before you get the schematics. So that, I would say probably a solid two years of design, ready for bid. So had you worked together before or for that side? Um, our firm, um, the Antuberman Architects, has been around, has been around about 43 or 4 years. I've only been there in the past 16 years, but we've been working with Willis Smith Design Engineering since before I came on board, and back when they were young people working for other engineering. Yeah. <laughs> really young. So even in their previous life before they had their own firm. So it was a very long, it's been a very long and continued relationship. And of course that helps because you have to really trust when you have a complicated problem like this that everybody, you know how everybody's going to work together. And you learn who's creative about certain things. I would not have wanted, in spite of many good structural engineers, engineer who was set on one material, one way of doing things, and they're happy it's just moved because this would have been an unmitigated disaster. <laughs>